For centuries, humankind gazed up at the night skies, pondering life's unsolved mysteries. From the first person orbiting Earth to Neil Armstrong's pioneering steps on the moon. Three, two, one. Space has been at the forefront of our advancement. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Tranquility. We copy on the ground. From agriculture, navigation, science to economics, life on Earth is guided by progress in space. Thousands of satellites act as eyes, ears, and beacons in the skies. Around the world, countries and companies launch space programs to explore new frontiers, further civilization, and dive deeper into our universe. We have the tools and resources to explore even further but we lack a strategy to get there. Unfortunately, space governance has not kept pace with these groundbreaking developments. But if we act now, we can protect the galaxy for future exploration and push the envelope of possibility. Securing space is the key to advancing life on Earth. The US and its allies are on the precipice of shaping a new tomorrow. Touchdown confirmed. Perseverance safely. On the surface of Mars, ready to begin seeking the sands of pathways. Here at the Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security, we share a vision for harmony in the space domain as we redefine how to advance space activity, who holds the key, and how far our explorations can go. We've developed a roadmap for security in space over the next 30 years, ensuring universal internet and developing keystone technologies over the next decade facilitating rocket transportation between different points on Earth and routinized activity in cislunar space. And establishing a new international space treaty and a security alliance for space. This vision for 2050 is only in the stars if space visionaries act today. Wow, uh, what an amazing video. Uh, you know, a lot of things uh, have been made worse by this period of time we've gone through uh, with the pathogen and COVID in the last year, more than a year. Uh, but uh, a lot has, uh, has improved the way we come together virtually in this time and the way that we've operated digitally as the Atlantic Council. I really want to congratulate the people who put together that amazing video, which really captures the sense of nostalgia that we have for everything that's been achieved in space in, in the past, but a sense of adventure, a sense of vision uh, for the future, a security alliance for space. And I hope we have a lot of space visionaries in the audience here as well. Uh, and I think this, we are really talking today about preparing for a new tomorrow, as the video says. So good afternoon and welcome. Uh, I'm Fred Kemp, I'm President and CEO of the Atlantic Council, and I'm delighted to uh, welcome you to today's event, The Future of Security in Space, a 30-year strategy. Uh, uh, and this is uh, done uh, with the support uh, of Airbus US uh, Space and Defense Inc., uh, our, our valued and a partner of many years. Um, we're delighted today to launch the paper of the same name as this event. Uh, it's the la latest Atlantic Council strategy paper. Uh, for the past year, the Atlantic Council's forward defense practice has been preparing this paper, charting a visionary strategy, or at least we hope it is, I hope you'll find it to be, for space security for the coming decades, guided by our co-chairs, former Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General James E. Cartwright, and former Secretary of the Air Force, Deborah Lee James, both are also board members of the Atlantic Council. I also want to give my heartiest congrats to the authors of this excellent paper, Clementine Starling, Mark Massa, Lieutenant Colonel Christopher Mulder, and Julie Siegel. Uh, it's re worth reading every, every word of this one. It emerges from what we see as a lack 
of a plan for the medium term and long term for US space strategy. Today, we'll have the opportunity to hear from two distinguished panels of civil, commercial, and uh, security space experts. We're also extremely pleased to be joined by Colonel Andrew Morgan, a currently serving NASA astronaut uh, for an interview, and to have a compelling presentation on remote sensing from Deborah Factor. To kick us off, I'll turn it over to our first moderator, Jennifer Griffin. Jennifer is a distinguished national security journalist with Fox News with years of experience covering topics related to defense, space, and national security. She's reported daily from the Pentagon since 2007. Jennifer, thank you so much for joining us today, and over to you. Thank you, Fred. I am thrilled to be part of the Atlantic Council and Scowcroft Center's launch of its new report. This landmark report really outlines the need for a new rules-based order in outer space and the perils of doing nothing as the world enters a new space rush, which is different, of course, than the space race that began during the Cold War when the Soviets launched its Sputnik, Sputnik satellite and the US landed on the moon. I think it's notable that we are launching the report today, the 60th anniversary of human space flight and Yuri Gagarin's historic orbit of the Earth. I want to welcome my panel, as you mentioned, retired Marine General James Cartwright, the former Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs and former head of US Strategic Command, who oversaw the country's nuclear weapons for years, Deborah James who I knew as the 23rd Air Force Secretary at the Pentagon and only the second woman to ever hold this position. Both General Cartwright and Secretary James, as you mentioned, have co-chaired this new report and served serve on the Atlantic Council Board of Directors. And retired Major General Charles Bolden, former NASA Administrator appointed by President Obama. Uh, General Bolden traveled to the International Space Station four times and Dr. Scott Pace, the former executive secretary of the National Space Council during the Trump administration. I want to welcome my panel and, and start with a question because all of you have different relationships to space, but what was your aha moment when you realized not just the possibility of this new space rush, but also the dangers? General Cartwright, I'll start with you. Well, thanks, Jennifer, and, and uh, it's great to see you again also. Uh, I think uh, for me, uh, aha moment probably came uh, when I was a strategic command uh, commander and uh, we were in the situation room, which was a, a brand new room called the JSPOC uh, that we had just stood up, Joint Space Operations Center, and we were watching the China ASAT test. And uh, the realities of understanding that that action uh, changed the game in space. It, it really changed the security environment. It took away or at least challenged some of the advantage that we had had for many years in the high ground of space. And it, it changed the relationship between the two countries. I don't want to overplay that uh, because it's not an adversarial necessarily, particularly in space. But it really said, uh, you're no longer alone up there. We're going to be up there too, and we're going to challenge you if we need to. And that changed the environment dramatically for me um, as, the as both a commander of operational space and the strategic command commander. That for me started to change the game. And I remember sitting in the Pentagon briefing room shortly after you were in the situation room asking questions about it. And that's my aha moment in terms of space debris, 128 million pieces of space trash that are still floating around threatening satellites and, and other uh, uh, the International Space Station and other things that are in orbit. Secretary James, what was your aha moment in terms of the dangers if we do nothing in space? Well, first of all, I would say thank you, Jennifer. Thank you to the Atlantic Council and thank you to the amazing authors who really did the heavy lifting on this report. I really think it is an important piece of a uh, very important effort and I hope everybody will take some time to, to read it. Anybody, first of all, who is uh, who was alive in the year 1969 and who has a, you know was old enough to even have the beginnings of memory, certainly we all remember where we were when Neil Armstrong took that first historic walk on the moon. So that was sort of the first aha moment of the wonder 
and of the magic and of the potential perhaps of space. But of course, I, I, I was a child and like everyone else, I was in awe. The next aha moment for me, flash forward to the year 1991, I was still relatively young, but an adult and I was a staffer on the House Armed Services Committee. And like the rest of the world, I watched in awe as Operation Desert Shield and Desert Storm unfolded, the operation against Iraq, the first Persian Gulf War. And this was the first time that the entire world saw precision weapons in use. It was the first time that stealth was used um, in, in the modern day. It was just the unfolding, I think, of uh, just unbelievable um, capabilities where we could literally put a weapon through a particular chimney in the middle of a block. Who had ever seen anything like that? No one before. All of this, of course, was enabled by space. So that was a real aha moment where I knew that space was going to be transformational for military operations. And then the last one I'll give you, I'm giving you three instead of one, I'm sorry. But when I was secretary of the Air Force, I remember being a pretty, pretty new secretary when all of a sudden a piece of what we thought was debris or junk, which we had been monitoring, uh, there had been no movement. Again, it was assumed to be junk. Uh, suddenly came alive. And we now know that that was a Russian satellite that was maneuvering in ways that were worrying, getting a little too close. And of course, this has happened now uh, frequently, many times since that point. So um, that was another aha moment. I remember shortly thereafter, we launched what was called a GSAP, which was a geosynchronous satellite in the geo orbit. It was our equivalent of a neighborhood watch in space saying, you know, we're keeping track of what's going on here. Don't threaten us. Thank you. General Bolden, what was your aha moment? Jennifer, I've had uh, several aha moments. And I, I, since I'm older than everybody else on the panel by a lot, um, I, I will say one thing. I, I appreciate it, but, but my four space flights were not to the International Space Station. When I left the program, it didn't exist yet. That's how old I am. Uh, but my first aha moment about risk came um, uh, I want to say it was just before I got uh, graduated from the Naval Academy when we lost the crew of Apollo 1 on the pad uh, with the Apollo fire. So if there was ever a doubt in my mind about the risk of human space flight, it was, uh, came through loud and clear then. My second was uh, when I was in the program 10 days after I landed from my first mission and we lost the crew of Challenger in January of 1986. Um, the aha moment related to that, however, was when the Air Force canceled the manned spaceflight engineer program almost immediately after the loss of, loss of Challenger, ha after having invested uh, quite a significant amount of money in uh, launch complex, Space Launch Complex 6 out at Vandenberg Air Force Base uh, and, and canceled the flight, the first flight, which was to be 62A on the shuttle, that would have been the first uh, dedicated DOD flight launched out of a DOD complex by a DOD flight crew. So that that was an aha moment about the fragility of uh, space and, and its dependence on will uh, and finance. And then my final moment, uh, I, I, like I said, I have too many, was um, when I had an opportunity to visit China uh, and meet with um, China's first astronaut after he had returned from a very successful Shinjo flight uh, to the accolades of a nation and literally 10,000 kids who were there for a international young astronauts conference and i had an opportunity to address them with him and i realized that these guys were um for real and uh and we better think about a way to collaborate with them or they could very easily replace us so those are several of my aha moments incredible incredible and you can forgive me for thinking you look so young i love it i love it <laughs> uh, dr pace what was your aha moment well, I was a uh, lab technician at JPL in the 1970s when uh, Viking landed on Mars. And uh, so that was terrific. Uh, you know, there were champagne bottles in every wastebasket uh, celebrating that first landing. I think this is great. I want to work here every summer. Um, but a few years uh, after that, while I was still uh, working there, um, I learned about the 1979 Moon Agreement. And this marks me as a policy wonk, um, which um, Several of us in that community were still thinking about what to do after Apollo and about commercial developments and about humans living and working in space and space settlements. 
And then the 1979 Moon Agreement came out, which was going to the Senate, and it really slammed us in the face because it had articles in there that forbade private property. Uh, it opened up things to inspection, it essentially created a socialist regime similar to what was envisioned for the Deep Seabed Convention. And I think what was shocking to me was that there were people, very serious, well-meaning people, who had a very different view about how the world and space should develop, and it was hostile to the kinds of democratic, capitalistic, free market uh, sorts of systems and values that I thought were an inherent American uh, right. So that was kind of my wake up call to policy and I actually got a little bit involved in that. Uh, the second wake up call uh, was building on, I think some of what uh, Secretary uh, James was saying about the Gulf War. Uh, I was familiar with GPS, I was working in the Department of Commerce at the time uh, we had a small, very small supporting role. Uh, one of the things we did was helping get uh, GPS receivers from commercial manufacturers uh, out to the fleet as fast as we could build them uh, using facilities at uh, NASA Ames, Moffett Field, uh, helping companies get batteries, slam them in, get them out to the fleet as fast as we possibly could. And one of the letters that came back to Charlie Trimble, who was the CEO of Trimble Navigation at the time, was from a special forces operator out there. Uh, thanking him for uh, the equipment and particularly gave some examples of how it had literally saved the lives of him and his teammates. And this was an example of commercial industry rising to the occasion, pressing into service without plan, the CEO stepping forward without worrying about how he was going to get paid and shipping it out to support forces in the field. And that power of commercial industry to respond quickly uh, using space uh, I think was my second major aha moment. So values and commerce uh, were the two things that I think have, uh, have woken me up. Thank you. Fascinating, fascinating. General Cartwright, can you outline some of the top line conclusions in the report and what we should be taking away from this? Sure, I'd be glad to. Um, I think, you know, when you look at the report and you look at where space is today and all of the opportunities that seem to lie in front of us, um, yeah, there are two documents out there that I have been referencing. Um, one is the Space Policy Directive 1, and the second one is the Artemis uh, document. And both of those set up uh, some very unique differentiators on how we're going to do space as we look to the future. The first one is that we're going to initiate sustained cislunar operations by the late 20s. That's a big step. That's routinizing cislunar at a level and scale that it is not today. The second one is that we're going to bring in private and competitive commerce into that environment. Um, you know, if the government doesn't support this, and if we are not able to bring the commercial sector along with us, then we're going to have what the paper calls the Wild West or gold rush, gold rush scenarios where there are no rules and everybody's just doing their own thing. And the third thing is this idea uh, that is called for in cislunar and beyond targeting Mars. Those three things are huge. That's why a 30-year strategy, one that looks at scaling the infrastructure and space up, creating the communication networks, the position navigation timing constellation GPS for Earth, we're gonna have to have the same thing for, for, the, for the cislunar area weather, life support, gateway services. I mean, all of these things have to be built and they're, they're not gonna happen overnight. And so having a strategy that looks beyond just the, the budget to an idea of where we're going so that all of the elements of government can see in context what's happening and where their roles are likely to play out and where they're gonna have responsibilities. I think that's critical. The second is this idea of cislunar. You know, why go to cislunar? Why is that important? And if we're going to move out there, what's it going to look like and how are we going to do it and who's going to pay for it? How are we going to pay for it? Those questions. But already we're starting to see the initial contracts of the gateway and the ISS like presence in cislunar and, a, and, a, and an activity called LunaNet, which is uh, similar to the low altitude uh, Starlink constellations going up on around Earth, uh, putting that together for the moon. Luna weather, uh, Luna PNT or, or GPS, all of those are ac actually very important. Space Force and Air Force have already let the initial contracts for Luna SSA, uh, an FAA-like activity to deconflict traffic. 
Uh, Luna spatial intelligence uh, contracts are now being let for remote sensing, which we'll hear a little bit more about later. Um, these are all things that are fundamental to do human sustained ops in accordance with the space directive and the Artemis objectives. And so I think these are critical as we look forward. The last are the norms and regimes. Um, we've already heard people talking about it here, the values and whatnot, but clearly we do not want a Wild West environment. And yet today we, for, for good, me good measure, that's what we have. Uh, there are no rules that are enforceable in space right now. You, you do it if you feel like it, if it aligns with what you want to do. And that's not going to work for us. We're going to have to figure out how to move forward in that. And that's where alliances and international partnerships are going to be so critical for what we do. Um, this is going to be a lot harder than the Arctic uh, you know, and, and a science uh, base. This is going to be the Arctic and nine dash line disputes in, in spades. Um, we're going to have to have a venue for cooperation that has to get going now, not later. Um, and so those three areas, the 30 year roadmap, cis lunar, and the norms and regimes constructs, those are the three things that the paper really focuses in on and tries to give us a long view on it, not just a one administration or one budget view on it. Thank you. And Secretary James, you have been outspoken about the how the 1967 Outer Space Treaty needs to be rewritten, renegotiated. Why do you think it needs to be rewritten? What's not in there that you think needs to be in it? And explain to us, you know, catch us up on what it is and what it doesn't do. Right, well, first of all, I agree with everything General Cartwright just said and rewriting or replacing in some fashion the 1967 Outer Space Treaty, I think is part and parcel, even though it's gonna take quite a while to negotiate such, such a thing, it's part and par parcel of coming up with new rules of the road so that space is not the Wild West. Look, the 1967 treaty is dated. It was written literally in a different era. Uh, the technology has changed. Uh, capabilities have changed. Um, it needs to be updated. At present, it is too broad. In some cases, it's probably overly specific. And essentially, it says there shall be no nuclear weapons or uh, other weapons of mass destruction in space. It says that there shall be no appropriation or seizure one country of a planet or a celestial body um, and that there shall not be military bases put on celestial bodies. There's more to it than that, but really that's the crux of it. And it doesn't say much more beyond that. So we just desperately need we need an update. We need to take into account um, such things as what do we do about debris? And is it OK for countries to just blow up satellites or, or let let it go. Do we need ways of removing debris if you create it? Um, what about the rules of the road when it comes to resource extractions? There's many commercial entities nowadays that are looking at mining on asteroids and some of the planetary could be just a, a decade beyond. Um, what about the rules of the road? Uh, I mentioned an aha moment about satellites getting too close. What are they doing that for? Maybe there should be some sort of rule of the road that says, you shall not come within a certain distance of another country or another commercial entity's satellites. And I do think another area for consideration ought to be an even broader information sharing when it comes to collision avoidance. Certainly we do a lot of that now in the United States, we have agreements, but I see that there might be possibilities to um, expand that. I'm just giving you some illustrative things, of uh, rules of the road, additional things that ought to be covered in an international agreement uh, they're not in the Outer Space Treaty at present. By the way, we should never do away with the Outer Space Treaty until and unless we have something better to put in there. And some of the principles in it clearly still apply, but it is insufficient for what we are living today, and it is certainly insufficient for 30 years from now. Thank you, Secretary James. Uh, General Bolden, you see ways that the U.S. can collaborate in space with China. We're seeing great power competition now move into outer space. Why do you think and in what ways can we collaborate with China in space? Can you give us some examples? You know, simplistically, uh, we can go back and do what we did with the Russians. Um, we, had a, we had a geopolitical purpose when President Clinton directed NASA to go back and reopen the, the almost complete treaty on the International Space Station and bring the Russians in. The Russians were not a, originally a partner 
But uh, but we did it then because we didn't want their scientists and engineers to go to really bad places. And we felt that it was more important for them to be a, uh, teamed with us. Um, you know, I think as we were doing in, in the course of the Obama administration was working with China to to try to help them under or <laughs> help to uh, try to get them to understand the critical importance of transparency and reciprocity and, and mutual benefit, the three principles that I think the U.S. always says when we work with other people. Um, I, I will join uh, General Cartwright in saying this is not going to be easy. Uh, everything in the report talks about U.S. leadership. Uh, U.S. leadership requires that we be willing to compromise and that we be willing to go to the table uh, if you look at UN Copius, the UN United Nations Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, we're there, but I'm not sure we're there with any degree of, se of seriousness and certainty, uh, or that we can make commitments that have to be made. The, the critical thing is we're going to have to be able to, to meet people halfway and, uh, and come up with agreements on what's, what's going to make us make things work. Uh, re debris removal, there, you've got a couple of questions about that. You can't do debris removal if you don't take care of Secretary James's point of about how, how close do we allow uh, one satellite to get to another one? Because we've got to develop the technology, which means we've got to practice on something. Uh, what kept us in NASA from being able to do several experiments with that would lead to debris removal was just differences with the intelligence community about, okay, how close do you want to get to my satellite? Or, or how do I know you're not coming close to my satellite, but you're going to another one? So those are some of the things we've got to, we've got to debate honestly and uh, make some really difficult decisions about, about how, how, how seriously are we looking at cooperation and collaboration. And Dr. Pace, you have been most recent of our, our panelists in government. What do you see as the potential flashpoints? How realistic is it to cooperate with China in space? Uh, what are your concerns about what you're seeing in terms of great power competition in space? Well, sure, thank you. Um, I guess I would start by saying, uh, actually, uh, across multiple administrations, we've been very uh, serious at cooperating in COPUS. Uh, I was there for about a decade uh, when I was uh, at the university and uh, working on development of the long-term sustainability guidelines, which were finally passed, I would point out, only after overcoming Russian opposition and uh, pretty much every other country in the world was for it. And we had to kind of, and the Russians were somewhat, uh, somewhat isolated in that. Um, I do take the point that we could be doing more with China according to the principles Charlie laid out of reciprocity, transparency, and mutual benefit. Uh, I could imagine things like sample exchanges, uh, exchanging biomedical data. Uh, I could imagine uh, being better, more transparent about operations, for example, out at Mars for exchanging of data. Uh, so far, the experience with the Chinese has been very mixed uh, in terms of them keeping those commitments, in terms of them having the data open. We've certainly seen Chinese behavior in other shared domains like cyberspace and the high seas, which have been questionable. Uh, so I see some potentiality for that. I would actually probably rule out, given the current state of politics, uh, having any sort of human spaceflight interaction. Uh, because human spaceflight is both symbolic as well as technical. It degree, demands a degree of trust that uh, I don't think we have. And the space cooperation tends to follow political conditions. It doesn't tend to precede them. So I think current conditions with China would allow some cooperation. Uh, but given the rest of the relationship, uh, I think we have to be careful that we don't try to take it too far. That's it. General Cartwright, talk to me about what you see as potential flashpoints, particularly when it comes to the Lagrange points, uh, satellites. Uh, when I was reading up on what the report is describing, it reminded me of the Strait of Hormuz. I'm not sure people realize just how crowded those Lagrange points are. Explain the significance and what we're seeing in terms of that traffic and what will happen if we do nothing. Sure, Jennifer, uh, I think it's, it's important to understand Lagrange points uh, are a set of points around the, the moon that have different interactions, but mostly associated with the, the, the joining or the neutral spot between the lunar gravity and the Earth's gravity. Those are the critical ones. They are areas where for minimum energy, you can place an asset for a long period of time. So it doesn't take a lot of fuel, et cetera. And you can hold those stations for a considerable period of time. The naval equivalent to that are the choke points, so to speak. I like that that both NASA and the administration have used the word gateway rather than choke point. Uh, 
but it is a place where people will pass through and it is a place where not only physical activity will occur but uh, electromagnetic stuff the comms will happen there the 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 weather uh, activities all of those things are advantaged by that intersection of the gravity and the low amount of energy that it takes to sustain and operate a satellite in those areas and so one of the things we're really worried about and one of the things the air force is addressing very early in the game is how do we keep track of that? How do we actually manage it? Because if I put a satellite in geostationary orbit, the only thing I worry about is its ability to look down on the Earth. If you put it at a Lagrange point, it's got to be able to look all through space. So it's not just one focus and area you've got to cover. And so people are going to have equities, particularly as commerce starts to move into those areas, about what's at those points and how, how far apart they have to be, et cetera. So they are critical. One of the, one of the Lagrange two is critical because it gives comms to the backside of the moon. And, the, and we were going to go there uh, when we were doing the Apollo program to put up because we envisioned that we would visit the backside of the moon. We never got there. The Chinese have already put a communication satellite there communicating with their rover on the backside of the moon. But these are the kinds of things that will happen at those points and policy and how we're going to do it and rules of the road are better um, gone at in this case by partnerships and by talking about it rather than by just putting something there and then competing and fighting for property rights and and uh, national rights. Secretary James, why is a 30 year time frame necessary when it comes to this model? What do you see happening in 30 years? Give us some examples of things we're going to that we can't even fathom right now that will be our reality over the next 30 years. Well, for one thing, space is just so critical for both security and prosperity here on Earth having a short-term strategy simply isn't gonna cut it. So we believe at the Atlantic Council, certainly that the 30 year strategy is the way to go. Some sort of a long-term, which will cross different administrations and take us into the future. The other reason why 30 years or something of a long-term nature is terribly important is that there's nothing in this report that's easy. This is all lengthy. So when we talk about negotiating a replacement for the 1967 Outer Space Treaty, for example, that is going to take years, years and years. There will be technological advances. We, we believe that over time there will be point-to-point -point space transportation across uh, the globe, which will provide for, you know, uh, quicker logistics across the globe. There are all kinds of things on the horizon, and these things are simply going to take time. So that's the reason for the 30-year 30 30-year um, strategy. The other point I, I just wanted to make uh, before running out of time on this panel is the types of, back to my Persian Gulf War example for a moment. Uh, we watched in awe as that unfolded. Our potential adversaries have we're also watching in awe. And they have been studying us very carefully ever since and been trying to figure out how to catch up so that they can capitalize on the capabilities that space can enable, as well as how to interfere with us. So there are a variety of threats, and we have to make sure over the long term that we keep pace, that we keep an edge, uh, that we play blocking and tackle, um, and that we make sure that our value systems for ourselves, our allies, really for the whole world are able to prevail in this race. Jennifer, can I add one thing real quickly? And it, it's 30 years or sometime longer is important from a business perspective. Uh, you know, Se Secretary James, General Cartwright, we all know American industry, we kill them because we, we don't, they don't know where we're going farther out. In the case of NASA, we've got to renegotiate with Congress every year. That's unsat. Uh, it's really hard to sustain, to put together a sustainable, affordable program if you're, if you're working on the contract or working on you know, giving them assurance that they're going to be able to continue doing what they're doing. Every, I mean, every five years is at least, that, that would help. But, uh, but every year, the way we do it now is just, it, it's not good for business. And when you say every year, you're talking about the defense budget, but what role, um, General Bolden, is private or private space companies like SpaceX having in terms of the development? How do you incorporate them in terms of this uh, new architecture for space? 
Well, uh, uh, very quickly, what they're depending on, SpaceX, Boeing, Sierra Nevada, any of the commercial companies that are now providing transportation, because NASA, the government, doesn't provide transportation to space anymore. We depend on the private sector. And so when we tell them that we're going to need to send crews to the International Space Station every three months, they count on that. And if for some reason, you know, that that doesn't happen, it really upsets their their planning and everything. A company like SpaceX that does everything, mostly uh, vertical development, everything in-house, they can't uh, they can't keep their prices where they are today if if we're uncertain about when we're going to honor our commitment to fly with them. And Dr. Pace, what happens if the U.S. does nothing and it is just a wild west for the next uh, 30 years? What happens if China and Russia don't agree to go along with a new treaty and a new architecture in space and they think that they have an advantage over the U.S.? What do we do? Uh, well, I think, I first of all, I, I disagree with the uh, idea that it is a wild west. In fact, there is a lot of customary international law that's already there. There's written tra treaty law, as has been pointed out. There's customary law. There needs to be more. Uh, so some of the issues about norms of behavior in space, uh, orbital debris removal, and a number of things like that, I think, need to be done. Uh, but we're already doing that. I mean, if you look at what's being done in uh, within COPUS, within the various standards bodies, that's what's being developed. And the process is one which is very much bottom up as opposed to a top down uh, treaty renegotiation. Uh, in some cases like the Russians, I think they're more amenable to direct one-on-one -on -one bilateral discussions, which we've had success with in the past. In the case of the Chinese, they tend to look more at kind of a global path. What's the pattern that other people uh, go with? And so there's really gonna be no one forum where all of this is going to come together. It's going to be one we're going to be working at a number of different levels. Uh, in terms of not going along uh, with a new treaty, I think one ought to assume that that's the default case. And in the meantime, what do you do? And I think uh, what uh, you do is what we've been pushing forward in terms of best practices coming from industry. Uh, industry has a number of areas. They were the ones who developed the orbital debris mitigation guidelines, which we got accepted as uh, broadly uh, throughout the UN. And then we turned around and incorporated them into national law and regulation. We didn't give our authority over to some transnational entity. If you go to the FCC and you get a satellite license, you will find yourself required to deal with end of life disposal requirements, which in turn have come from internationally recognized debris mitigation guidelines, which in turn came bottom up from US industry. So it's that accretion by practice, not dictation by lawyers who may or may not have practical experience that I think is going to be our way forward. And Secretary James, what is um, what is the Pentagon doing well right now from your perspective? You were opposed to the creation of the Space Force. What is it doing well? Well, um, I think the Pentagon is making strides forward to speed up the acquisition process, to focus more on early prototyping, and then how do we get beyond the valley of death for more of these systems to get them into to use? So I think. Every year, every team who has served in the Pentagon advances the ball more and more. You're right, Jennifer, I did oppose the creation of the Space Force, but you know what, we've got it now. Essentially, it remains a carve out of the Air Force Space Command, but with the um, uh, General Raymond who leads the Space Force, of course, now is a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, so that's a big change. So it's incumbent on everyone now to make sure whether you were for it or against it to make it work. And again, I come back to just how very important space is. That's why everybody needs to come together here and to make it work. Um, I also believe it's important to point out we still are number one in space, but some of our, uh, I'll say leap ahead favor, the leap ahead technologies that used to favor us, others have caught up and they've figured out ways to possibly interfere with us in space. And so that's where we have to make sure that we keep on our toes, that we keep investing, that we keep bringing the, the cost of going to space down, down, down. This is another area that the, um, that the report calls out. It calls out key technologies that between government and the private sector, we need to collectively continue to invest in over the course of the next 30 years. So I'm talking about technologies which would enable reusability, we need more small launch capability going forward and small satellites so that we don't just have these billion dollar satellites which can 
serve as exquisite targets for possible adversaries. We talked about uh, debris uh, removal already. We, we also talked a little bit about on-orbit uh, servicing. So these are the types of capabilities in R&D that we collectively need to continue to invest in. And General Cartwright, what flash points do you see right now? I know you also wanted to explain a little more by, about how important a cis-lunar approach is. Explain. Uh, the flash points, at least in my mind, are, uh, are potential areas where um, uh, we just uh, this week uh, saw the National Intelligence Council release their latest update, which just looks out to 2040. And the, and the repetitive theme going through that was the undermining of these norms and regimes of countries deciding not to play by the rules of countries not having rules that they felt were equitable to them. And so to me, it is where the holes exist in this fabric. Um, law is one thing, norms and regimes, treaties, rules of the world road, how close can you come to me? Can you get in my way? Are you laying in my beam, et cetera, are gonna be flashpoints for disagreement. And the question is, can we build relationships and alliances that can sustain themselves through the obvious disagreements that will come? The National Intelligence Council says, this is gonna be the flashpoint all the way through, the, through from now until at least 2040. It's these norms and regimes and having them be responsive to industry, to governments, et cetera, and not have just one way. In other words, the US can't just say it's gonna be this way. We gotta be willing, as Charlie Bolden said, to meet people halfway and to figure out how to do this. And Dr. Pace, talk about the transition between administrations and the dangers of either letting uh, the National Space Council leadership lag or emphasis shift between administrations? Uh, well, I have to say that um, uh, in the context of a 30-year plan, which I'm, uh, as an academic, I love, as a practitioner, I'm skeptical of, um, maybe 30-year plan for containment might have worked, but a 30-year plan on space, I'm happy with four to eight years. As Charlie said, uh, we go through these budget cycles and revisits all the time, and which are very, very challenging. Uh, but in that regard, I think the administration is doing great on space. Uh, one of the most important things is sustainability in transition, keeping on target. Uh, the administration has supported the Space Force. The administration has supported Artemis objectives. The administration has said they'll retain the Space Council in some form, we'll see. The administration has proposed a strong um, increase in the NASA budget, which is on the same track that uh, we were trying to do in the last administration, uh, showing a commitment. There's some more science money in there, but also strong money for lunar landing. So in terms of a major transition and a strategy that's focused on cislunar uh, and that recognizes the importance of space, uh, I got to say that so far this administration is doing pretty much what we need to be done, which is keep that strategic target. Uh, I think the areas where there'll be challenges coming up um, are going to be dealing with this more complex and security environment. And uh, we've already, uh, the what to do about that has already actually been laid out and General Raymond and others are already uh, working on. In terms of deterrence, we're dealing not just with the space environment, but we have to deal with all domains. There's no such thing as space war or space deterrence. There's, there's war, there's deterrence, there's balance. And space is integrally part of a cross-domain effort, land, sea, air, cyberspace. Number one job is to continue to provide capability to the joint force, which they absolutely depend upon. We ought to keep a vision to sizzling our space as to what will come in the future. But for right now, that needs to be led uh, by the civilian sector, by the commercial sector, with the military keeping an eye on it, but their day-to-day -day job is gonna be focused on Earth. So I would say in terms of a long-term strategy, uh, the current transition uh, is really has made a great step in, in that direction. So I commend them for it. And General Cartwright, I have a question here for you. Uh, the Wolf Amendment requires NASA to certify with the FBI that any proposed contacts with China pose no technology transfer uh, threat. What problem does the Wolf Amendment pose to coming up with this new space architecture? Uh, we have to be careful. I mean, if if everybody we talk to is the enemy, 
and every there's a boogeyman behind every question and every opportunity, uh, we're not going to go anywhere. We're frozen. So we need to find a way to legitimately protect those things that we want to protect, but to be more open and transparent to long-term goals, the ability to share space, um, operate together in space, compete in space um, in ways that we probably right now are taking our terrestrial examples and exporting them to space. And, and it's probably not a good thing to do. I think probably Charlie has worked on this stuff more than anybody on it. I, I will say as the cause of the Wolf Amendment, um, it is not as bad as people think. And, you know, when Frank, when Congressman Frank Wolf first wrote it and put it into the 2011 NASA budget and uh, the White House budget, actually, for, for OSTP, um, it was onerous. But, but he came around as we talked to him. And I think when I talk about being able to meet people halfway, um, I, I think the administ any administration must find a way to work with Congress and help understand what it is we want to do. Constancy of purpose is something that we, that we talked about at NASA all the time. What is it that we want to accomplish and how do we keep going? Dr. Pace talked about his, his pleasure with, with this administration. I, I think we've been going about three or four administrations now on a relatively straight line path uh, toward exploration and and uh, collaboration and the like all the last three or four administrations have really promoted international relations and uh, opening up space to what we call what President Obama used to refer to as non-traditional partners so I think that's what we've got to do is maintain our our trajectory um, and I and I think there is hope I have a question here from Mir Sadat, former NSC Policy Director for Space, and we only have a minute left, but we'll go to Dr. Pace. Uh, General Raymond has spoken about building a space force for the next 100 years. How do you envision the newest and 18th member of the Intel community, the role of US Space Force as we develop this cislunar and eventual triplanetary economy? Only a minute left, unfortunately. Um, I guess the, the shorthand I would say is there are people uh, who look at space and envision a blue water Navy in the Royal Navy or U.S. Navy post-World War II kind of mold. Uh, I think that's too soon. Uh, all of our strategic interests are all still on Earth. Uh, and therefore, I think thinking of what Space Force is doing as more of a coastal or even a brown water Navy is probably a better analogy uh, that we're going to be focused on uh, providing services to the Joint Force, we're going to provide certain options for the National Command Authority. We want to make sure that we understand everything that's going on up there. But exploration and development is still going to be very much a civilian and commercial driven entity. If U.S. national interests change in the future and we have vital national interests on Mars or you know, on the moon or something like that, there'll be a revisiting of that. But I th and so while it's helpful to think about the far future, I think for the immediate present, the next FIDEP or two FIDEPs or three FIDEPs, uh, are really going to be, I think it's better to think about it as focusing on delivery to the Earth. And uh, so the Blue Water Space Navy is still a while away, uh, much to the disappointment of some of my colleagues. Thank you, Dr. Pace. And Secretary James, I'll give you the last word. We only have a, a minute, but why can we not afford to not do anything as we enter this next period in space? Um, if the United States and our allies choose not to lead the way forward, I guarantee you other countries will step into the fray. There are quite a few these days, and I put Russia and China at the top, who are spacefaring nations. They don't all hold our same values. And I come back to some of them are investing and testing in ways that are very, very um, worrisome to the United States and to our allies. And so we are blessed to have alliances and partners around the world. This is where we need to leverage those relationships and um, make sure that we keep a leading position and that the space domain re remains open uh, for all so that the entire world can uh, have security and also to prosper. Thank you very much, panelists, and thank you to the Atlantic Council for this incredible discussion today and this fantastic report. I, I urge everyone to read it and absorb it because it will be a document for uh, years to come that we will be referencing. Thank you again.
Thank you, Ms. Griffin and our esteemed panel. Good afternoon. I am Lieutenant Colonel Chris Mulder, Air Force Officer and current Military Fellow at the Atlantic Council. Before I continue, I want to ensure the live link to space from our simulated locations, NASA's Mission Control Center and the International Space Station respectively are operational. Colonel Morgan, how do you read? Chris, I've got your line clear, how me? Good copy, down at uh, Mission Control Center. I will briefly introduce Colonel Andrew Morgan, current NASA astronaut, before diving into questions as we explore the human element of space exploration, discovery, and security. Thank you so much, Colonel Morgan, for taking the time to participate in the Atlantic Council's Future of U.S. Security and Space event on International Human Spaceflight Day. Colonel Morgan is a graduate of the United States Mil Military Academy at West Point and received his Doctorate of Medicine from the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences in Bethesda, Maryland. After serving in special operations, he was selected as an astronaut in 2013 as part of the 21st astronaut class. He spent significant time on the International Space Station in 2019 and spanning into 2020. His entire flight in space consisted of 4,352 Earth orbits and a journey of 115.3 million miles. He has multiple accolades and interesting aspects to his life, too many to name here. As you know, Colonel Morgan, the paper we are releasing today is all about securing space in a responsible and methodical way that will inspire and benefit all humankind into the future. In this context, I would like to explore a few things with you. Can you paint a picture for our audience by explaining how space benefits us on Earth? Absolutely, thank you, Chris. I appreciate it. It's my pleasure to be with you and all the distinguished panelists today. I wish I was uh, talking to you from the International Space Station, but instead we are simulating it today. And I was going to speak from the perspective of living on the ISS because, of course, that is my uh, my uh, exclusive experience in space and probably the best example of how we use space uh, in human space flight. Um, we often say that the International Space Station is off the Earth for the Earth, and we do that to characterize that we are in space for the benefit for the benefit of humanity. And there are four objectives, uh, four accomplishments of the ISS that we see as ongoing objectives that I think are worth highlighting. First of all, that it's a world-class scientific laboratory. While I was on board the ISS, my crew and I performed over 300 different scientific experiments. And these span the full gamut of uh, scientific disciplines from uh, chemistry to physics to earth science, biology, medical, uh, the, the every, anything you can imagine, it's we are doing it on board uh, on board the International Space Station on a daily basis. It fills the majority of our time um, because it is one of our top priorities. The second thing is it's an incredible engineering marvel. Um, it's a demonstration of what countries can do when they come together. It is it re represents a substantial investment of multiple nations. Uh, and it was built piece by piece, spans two, spanned two decades. So it was put together and, and brought engineering philosophies from around the world together, oftentimes being assembled for the first time in space. Then next, it's a, been an incredible test bed for commercial industry. And there are lots of examples of that, some we've already touched on today. Um, many of the payloads and experiments on board the ISS are commercial in nature or commercially sponsored. Um, the commercial resupply that, that provides us the supplies and the um, uh, movement of logistics and equipment to and from the ISS. And then, of course, the demonstrations of the commercial crew program, the U.S. crew vehicles, um, SpaceX Dragon, which we are preparing to launch now for the third time here in the next couple of days. So a tremendous example of developing commercial industry in low Earth orbit as well. And then finally, it's an an absolutely wonderful example of international partnership and um, how we can cooperate on a grand scale. Wow, it's a lot, <clears throat> a lot going on. Um, as, as I mentioned, you've spent a lot of time in space. Specifically, you've spent 272 days on the International Space Station and you accomplished seven uh, spacewalks. Um, building upon what you, what you uh, already spoke to us about, do you view space and its benefits differently now that you have physically spent so much time in space? 
Well, I do. I got to see firsthand how dynamic it is and how we are at a full sprint now uh, in the ISS. So the ISS was, we started constructing it back in 1998. And so by the time I arrived, it was fully constructed and in its full utilization capacity. Um, and we're, we've been able to uh, see how, uh, or I was able to see firsthand how um, busy we are and how we're expanding the commercial vehicle traffic. We've expanded the crew size. Our mission durations are getting longer and longer, and that is becoming more and more normal. I, I, my mission was nine months. One of my crewmates, Christina Cook, her mission was 11 months. A few years before that, Scott Kelly's was just shy of a year. And then even Mark Van Hai on board the ISS right now um, is preparing for the, the uh, possibility that he may be up there longer than six months as well. So that's becoming very normal and we're seeing a, a lot of dynamic activity. What that allows us to do is, is get the most out of, uh, out of the ISS. Um, and to your question, the, what does using the uh, ISS to its max capacity do is it allows us to um, get reap even more benefit for humanity. We do the science and the demonstrations that we do on board for the benefit of those back on Earth, but also to enable ourselves to explore and go deeper into space on the moon and then uh, on the Mars, um, but also science for the sake of scientific discovery. Mm -hmm. So it's an extremely um, exciting time on board. And I, and I just have to say for a, sh a shout out to um, NASA and our international partners it has been undeterred in the face of the pandemic. This uh, this has accelerated um, on pace and has not been slowed down by um, any of, um, we, we've learned to work around in the pandemic environment, which is a real um, credit to NASA and all of our partners around the world. Well, that's great to hear that uh, you and the rest of the NASA team were able to, uh, you know, take advantage of uh, in un um, uh, unusual circumstances this last year, but, uh, you know, advanced um, space, you know, for, for us. Um, finally, as we wrap up this conversation, is there anything that we may not realize about space uh, that is important for us, you know, to, to know? Uh, yes, I, I, you know, we've already, you know, I'm talking to a very um, space wise audience right now. And I know that um, everybody realizes that we're at this exciting, inflection point in our, if you just look back at the, the last two years alone, the the changes that we've seen in, in, in civil um, sp uh, space, NASA, the ISS that I've alluded to, but also uh, I'd be remiss not to mention the Artemis program, which is NASA's um, bold plan to go return to the moon and put the first woman and the first person of color on the surface of the moon in this decade um, as a stepping stone to go on to Mars. So that, that's been very exciting. Um, I mentioned commercial and the, 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 the developments we've seen there, um, but also, you know, as a military officer, I'm a military officer first, there's have been some um, interesting developments in defense space as well with the reestablishment of U.S. Space Command, the establishment of uh, U.S. Space Force. So we are at this, this critical time, this critical juncture that we we've, are witnessing around us just in this recent past. Um, and each of those, I think, has a potential uh, to be an instrument of diplomacy. And uh, human spaceflight, I think, has a role in each of them. But, you know, as a practitioner of civil human spaceflight, when you look back at the tradition that began uh, with one of the earliest partnerships in space in 1975 with the Apollo Soyuz test program, onto the Shuttle Mir program, now in the ISS program, and in the programs we have still ahead of us. Um, that the cooperation in, in space transcends geopolitics, and it is an important, a critical venue um, for partnership in space and cooperation and, uh, and, and interlinkages inter between nations. So it's been a real pleasure to be a part of this panel discussion, and uh, I look forward to hanging on and listening to the upcoming speakers as well. Awesome. Thanks, Colonel Morgan. I think you hit it on the head there. Transcends, you know, multiple different aspects of our lives as, as humans and uh, having those partnerships and alliances and having a vision is uh, very, very important. So thank you uh, for taking the time to motivate, educate and share a human perspective, perspective of space. All the best as you continue to advance the importance of space and serve as a role model for us all. Thank you. Now I'd like Chris. to, thanks. Now I'd like to introduce Ms. Deborah Factor, 
Ms. Factor is head of U.S. Space Systems for Airbus, U.S. Space and Defense. She manages the national security space and space exploration businesses within U.S. Space Systems. She has an exceptional 30 plus year career in the aerospace arena, leading, guiding, and transforming the organizations she associates with. Thank you for your tremendous insights and leadership during the development of this paper, Ms. Factor. The floor is yours. Thanks, Chris. Glad to be here. And wow, what a, a great opening to the session today. Um, as you mentioned at the very beginning, Airbus has been a long partner of the Atlantic Council, and uh, we were pleased to support the overall study and all of the authors. I think thank them as well um, of looking at the future of security in space, which is so important to our everyday lives. And um, sort of our interlude, uh, hard to follow an astronaut, um, but astronauts are looking down on, on Earth every day from the, the first time that humans had looked down, the famous pictures from the moon, uh, uh, looking back on space, back on Earth and realizing what precious resource we have. So what I wanted to do today was just share a few insights on on the value of remote sensing and uh, showing its benefits of space to our everyday lives on Earth. Um, maybe you can pull up my pull up my my first uh, slide there. And uh, someday we will we will be back in person at the Atlantic Council. And if you weren't sure uh, where it was, that uh, pretend we're here at the yellow the yellow arrow there. Uh, this picture was actually taken by. Uh, one of the Airbus Pleiades satellites. It's a commercial constellation that we invested in. It's a 50 centimeter resolution. So you can kind of get a sense of what Washington DC looks like uh, today. I should say that uh, Airbus actually launched its first Earth observation satellite in 1986 and has built and delivered over 50 Earth observation satellites for a number of customers uh, with a combined 30 years of in orbit operation and without any in orbit failures. So we're pretty, pretty proud of that. And uh, I'll share a few of those images with you today to get a sense of um, what Earth looks like from space. So next slide. Um, space capability has really enabled us to learn so much about Earth. And uh, we have now much more sophisticated, very high resolution images from uh, government customers and all the way down to commercial constellations that are giving us information about weather, climate change, agriculture, our environment, maritime traffic, aviation, um, land mapping, land change, et cetera. And uh, I think as, as space gets a little more um, a good, good coverage, in, in our everyday lives, we are uh, kind of learning how, how much it plays in uh, decisions that are made that affect our overall security, economic security, uh, national security, environmental security, much of which is the theme of the paper that hopefully everybody uh, has had or will have a chance to, um, to read. There's obviously a lot of science that goes behind um, uh, learning what images mean from space and the evaluation of those, the layering of different techniques, um, and also different uh, different purposes and perspectives that we can get from uh, a variety of technical capabilities in uh, all parts of the spectrum, and uh, uh, the ability to see through clouds or not see through clouds, um, to detect various particles in the atmosphere that give insight, for example, to winds um, or uh, hurricanes and weather patterns, as well as just uh, the understanding of various activities on, on the ground, even um, from understanding thermal signatures uh, using radar and other, other technologies. So maybe I'll give you a couple of, of examples. Go to the next slide, please. So just purely looking at resolution um, and kind of like on your on your camera, 
where you can take uh, your iPhone perhaps is understanding what kind of resolution and how clear or blurry that may be, where there's lots of different purposes. This uh, montage of imagery shows you how technologies have developed over time and how different levels of resolution allow us to see and learn more. So on your left, this is a picture taken by a disaster monitoring constellation and built by Airbus. This has a 22 meter resolution. So as you can uh, see, that, that really is showing how, um, uh, uh, it, it doesn't seem like can, we can see very much, but at that wide field, we can get a great understanding of change detection and uh, how changes happen over time and compare those um, images and learn more perhaps about land patterns, population uh, changes, uh, uh, or various activities that might be happening, say, at an airport. And as you progress across the slide, we use different technologies and different satellites, different resolution from a radar constellation to our spot image satellites and all the way to our newest Pleiades commercial um, constellation. And you can see now from that left where at the big picture I can see uh, how changes might take place and all the way to the right, I get a very good feel for some tactical activities, say, at an airport. Let's go to the next one. So here's an example where clarity is really key. So on the left, you might say, well, what am I looking here? This picture is from 2009 and is an example of some electro-optical imagery that was used to locate a maritime vessel that was hijacked by Somali pirates. This was in the Gulf of Aden, and it was an, uh, an, oil, an oil tanker. So the photo detail on the deck was so clear that the ship could be seen from space. And ultimately, that imagery and analysis uh, led to a successful rescue effort by the US Navy. So this shows an example where you see an environment, and in this case, something that really had an impact on, uh, on security. So in the next slide. So uh, this may be very recognizable to, uh, to everybody. It's a uh, very recent imagery just from March 25th of last month. And here's an example of the Suez Canal uh, blocked by a cargo ship. We all watched with great interest of what was, how did that happen and what was going to happen. So the satellite imagery is showing us uh, not only where the blockage was in the canal, but it also gave a sense of the traffic backed up on either side of the canal waiting, waiting to go th through and helped a satellite imagery helped aid uh, the trafficking ship traffic around the globe of where that trade was going to go. Um, and here's an example of we all know uh, uh, goods and services that were delayed as a result of this blockage and space really helped understand, uh, play a, a role in understanding not only the problem, but what the potential solution was as ship traffic was redirected away from, from the canal. And this is really showing uh, persistence is really key when you are uh, monitoring from, uh, from space. So the next one. So another example of climate change and mother nature uh, makes moves and we often uh, are not quite sure what those effects are and then leading us to understand some of the background. On the left, this is an image captured of a Malibu wildfire in Los Angeles area in 2018 by our Spot Image uh, 6 satellite. And on the upper right is the movement of a cracking uh, Olarsen ice shelf in Antarctica from 2017 to 2018. And you could really in that upper right photo see the difference of the ice uh, cracking. So this is showing some of the climate change effects that we can see from space and supporting the scientific research that's so important to uh, keeping us safe and understanding uh, uh, how mother nature's impacts can, can affect our overall environment of Earth. In particular, Earth observation, electro-optical and synthetic aperture uh, radar is important in these measurements. Next slide. And finally, it's just bringing it right back to our, our everyday life on, on Earth and uh, uh, how, how we recognize that Earth is a precious resource and there's things that happen every day that affect us. 
The picture on the right is the eye of Hurricane Irma from our Tirasar X satellite in 2017. And uh, weather forecasts are so important to, uh, well, for example, today I probably should have paid attention to the weather because I need an umbrella outside and all the way to how air traffic is monitored across the world to uh, where ships are going and even to whether to evacuate a major city like New York City or Houston when a hurricane is predicted. Now what we're seeing is new technologies such as machine learning and artificial intelligence, which are allowing us to detect patterns in tracking uh, all these different images and uh, uh, detection that we've seen from space capabilities and put those into algorithms that will let us predict the future. And I think that is a very exciting place to be and perhaps is a nice lead in uh, to, uh, to our next panel. Um, hopefully this gives everybody a little, a little sense of, of the role of remote sensing on, on Earth. And I'm really excited to have have the next panel delve into some additional details that were introduced um, by the first panel. So thank you for thank you for the opportunity and looking forward to moving on. Thank you so much, Deborah, for that very interesting presentation to really set the framework for the second panel of the event today. Uh, I'm Jacqueline Felcher. I'm a national security and space reporter at Politico. I'm so excited for this conversation to build on the insights we heard in the first panel and dive into the report in a little bit more detail. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panelists. I'm joined by Deborah Factor, the head of U.S. Space Systems at Airbus UN's U.S. Space and Defense, who you've already heard from today. Uh, Ellen Chang, the head of the Naval Portfolio at H4X Labs. Matthew Daniels, a former advisor to the Director of Net Assessment in the Defense Secretary's Office and a Senior Fellow at Georgetown University's Center for Security and Emerging Technology. Greg Marinak, the Co-Founder, Secretary, and Director of the XPRIZE Foundation. And last but not least, Yana Robinson, the Managing Director and Space Security Program Director at the Prague Security Studies Institute. So I think it's very clear we have an all-star panel lined up today. One quick reminder for the audience before we jump in, we will have time for audience Q&A at the end. So please use the Q&A function on the bottom of your Zoom window to submit any of your questions. Um, and now let's get started. Mm. We heard a lot during the first panel about how the commercial space sector is playing an increasing role in the space community. Um, even you know, NASA isn't sending astronauts to space anymore. They're just relying on the commercial sector for that transportation. Um, and one of the report's recommendations called for increased public-private partnerships, especially increased government funding and government investment in things like space launch. So to start off with, Deborah, I'd like to start with you. How can the government be a better partner to industry? Well, as you mentioned, space is definitely a place where, where the government has played a, a huge role. I think one, one, one thing that commercial industry is looking for is an environment uh, a business environment that that is predictable and one that we know um, how to operate and and where to invest. So we like the government to share their requirements, share their needs. We like them to be creative in the approaches and uh, flexible in how they can uh, incorporate innovation. We like to hear what the future future plans are such that we can adjust investments that may be needed. And we also like the government to be clear on, uh, on regulations or policy that affect how we do our business. Everything from contracting to R&D taxes to, um, uh, to even human capital and, and, um, and recruiting. So, uh, having that active engagement with government helps both sides understand more about uh, how we can work together. Ellen, I'd like to get your take on this as well, since you represent a, a slightly different area of the space industry. What are ways that the government, what are things that the government can do to help industry really thrive? Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me and thanks for um, that question. Let me just give a little bit of 
color on my background, given that my title might not necessarily draw that out. So over the past, I would say 10 years, I've been investing and over the past five years, investing more aggressively or more actively and in, in, in startups. So I'm not a venture, I don't run a venture fund, but I do have a syndicate and we do have several investments in, in so-called the new space air arena. Um, some of these companies have, have done well, some of them haven't done well. Um, so I come at from that angle. Um, I will say that that, that commercial space sector is growing. Uh, clearly a lot of those companies still depend on government revenue, but increasingly there's other markets that are being developed slowly um, to, and maturing so that they're generating more and more revenue from elsewhere. Um, I wanna bring that to light because I think the government plays a great role in providing seed investment to some of these companies but I'm more, exper more excited about some of these other markets that are being developed, which actually brings me to some comments on the report. I think the 20, 20, um, the 30 year perspective is very, very important, but sometimes I even feel that we need to get started now. Um, already in some of my conversations, uh, especially around some uh, younger folks who are inspired by entering into the space sector and becoming uh, engineers and innovators in this sector, they're very concerned about the space debris issues, especially as some of the larger, um, I guess that, you know, Elon Musk with his Starlink and Amazon with their Kuiper and some of the Chinese startups are actually going to probably each be launching over 100,000 satellites over the next few years, all in Leo. And so, so, so some, of, some of the folks are quite concerned about that. Um, obviously, earlier in the earlier panel, we talked about uh, nefarious activity happening in space, you know, some uh, testing that might, that basically would impact some of our geostationary satellites. Um, even from, from a commercial perspective, just the, t the television, sat satcom, and as well as satellite TV, that, per that budget right there, or I should say revenues, global revenues there, is already over 40 billion. And with Elon Musk and Amazon coming online with everybody vying for, um, developing other types of com uh, companies or revenue sources, I think that um, that could, you know, at least they're making a big bet that they want to double, double and make, uh, and make lots of money, you know, from that space perspective. Um, I would just say that from a government perspective, besides providing, I guess, predictable, forward looking um, types of approaches, I would say that there's there's also some mechanisms where do we want to stimulate the technology development in our country? Because if so, I think the government needs to back some of the earlier investments of technologies that are going to realize the future types of missions that we've all, all talked about. And I'll, I'll pause there and turn it back to you. Well, great. Um, Greg, I, I, want, I want to turn to you. Your organization, the XPRIZE Foundation, is all about incentivizing next generation technology. So I'm wondering sort of from, from an outsider of government perspective, what, what tips would you give the government in terms of ways, ways to incentivize innovation and get industry excited about you know, big, big goals? Um, is, is there any, anything you think the government can learn from organizations like yours to really push industry to, to jump on the next big thing? Well, governments play a, a really critical role. You know, it's it's popular to, to dismiss the role of governments, but they they play a role of setting a vision, and it's an area where where the civil space programs of the world have, uh, have sort of waited for John Kennedy to rise up out of the grave and come up with a good vision. Uh, but uh, the vision has to be about important things, and I think this report is important because uh, it acknowledges some of the new facts that we live in that are radically different than these treaties of the, the 60s, when people were treating space like a little place like Antarctica, when in fact, it's everything else. It's the rest of the universe. Uh, and we are in a space race today, but it's a fundamentally different space race. It's not a race of superpower versus superpower. It's a race of civilization uh, versus time we're facing a 100% catastrophe. It's not, the probability is one, it's not 0.1, that we are facing climate change. And we can use the energy and material resources of space 
to address that problem, which is the existential problem for every man, woman, and child alive today, all 10 billion almost of us. Uh, but we have a limited launch window. And uh, we don't know how long that window is when, when humans have the capability and the political wherewithal and the abundance to deal with this problem. So uh, realizing that we live in a two world system, uh, including Earth's offshore island, the moon in its strategic thinking is really important. It's the first step toward realizing that the entire solar system is rich for humanity and gives us many thousands of years of runtime uh, is critically important. And if we have that vision and we set our private industries around the world toward working on the pieces of that vision and key technologies that are needed to open up that vision, things like transmitted energy for space propulsion or for sending power from, from where the sun shines all the time, which is any place beyond geostationary orbit, uh, to the cities and megacities where all of us will, or most of us will live the remainders of our lives. Uh, those kind of things uh, are the, the role that, that government can take. And if we want a truly secure future, we need to have security, not against each other, but against uh, these big problems that we all face. We, we talked already just in the, the few minutes this panel has been going on about just how much is in space? Everything, you know, today, today we have communications and earth observation to, you know, looking farther out, things like using um, resources found in space. And um, there's obviously a lot of infrastructure in space that goes along with all of this. So Matt, I, I'd love to get your thoughts on, you know, as we launch a national conversation about investing in infrastructure, whether people should think of space as being a part of that. Absolutely. So there's this tendency to think of um, space as this like nostalgic thing. But the whole exciting moment that we're in is that the most exciting things that we're going to do in space are going to be just in the next few decades. So it's uh, we're at this kind of hinge point from being a country with a space program or two to being a spacefaring country where we go into space for many reasons and we expand from there. For infrastructure in space, uh, we're looking at over the next 10 or 20 years, some part of the Earth's internet infrastructure being in LEO. That's going to be hugely impactful. So that's why I, I think and hope we'll come back to talking about orbital debris and space security and how we think about that kind of infrastructure. But at the same time, we are an optimistic society. We're at our best when we are an optimistic society. There's an old uh, maxim in the space community it's kind of a joke and a maxim, both together. Uh, it was coined, it was um, improved by someone named Ben Finning, who was an anthropologist who studied Polynesian expansion across the Pacific. And so the kind of joke and maxim together is something like, if God wanted humans to be a spacefaring species, uh, we would have a moon and also a solar system full of small asteroids and planets and other moons to step out to and expand across the solar system and expand from there. So we've got this tremendously exciting moment in the years ahead. I like each battery because it focuses on cislunar space. That is our first stepping stone. That's the first place too, where it's not just the kind of leading edge of exploration, but it's also our entire society starting to expand into space and build new things in space. As we talk about the, the American commercial space landscape and sort of what, what it looks like and what, what issues it's facing, uh, Yana, I'd like you to weigh in here on what other nations' commercial landscapes look like, commercial communities look like, and how how those private industries operate differently than the American space industry. Yes, thank you. If I may, I will first step back and uh, paint a little bit of a broader picture, actually benefiting from the first panel, because I think all the panelists gave um, us some key, key aspects we need to understand as we move forward with space activities into the next decade and beyond. General Bolden and General Cartwright, they talked about US leadership in space and together with allies and partners, and also talked about the need for maybe new partnerships or non-traditional partnerships, which could mean both uh, state actors, but obviously also industry, I mean, commercial, uh, commercial partners. 
Uh, Secretary James also mentioned the competition between the United States and other major space powers, mainly China and Russia. And Dr. Pace talked about the role of deterrence uh, that needs to uh, help uh, stability uh, of the space activities as we move uh, into the more commercial space activities uh, on orbits and beyond. Uh, I think one of the things also that Dr. Pace mentioned is the difficulty to negotiate any kind of international understanding uh, on, a, on a legal level. And he mentioned the need to really work, continue to work on the best practices led by the industry. So I think that there is a great, great deal of discussion um, concerning the growing importance of space commerce, but there is uh, a less focus on the downside risks and threat stemming uh, from, from such activities. So one of my principal concerns uh, over the maybe even next 30 year horizon, but certainly for the next five to 10 years, is the sustainability of space commerce. And I say that because there are two models uh, that are operating out there uh, that I know of, uh, which are like having different track gauges. Uh, for the railroads. So one is born of more of a dependencies and the other is based on assistance related activities uh, and, 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 and allowing independence. So I, I worry because when you get into the kind of model that for example, China and Russia uh, pursue, it is a world of store, store, sole source contracts the world of vertically integrated uh, supplier packages, basically soup to nuts. Uh, then there is the subsidized financing, which looks easy on the front end, but is oftentimes very difficult to repay later on the part of the recipient um, countries. So uh, moreover, there are dependencies with political strings attached. So I think China and Russia will certainly expect the partner countries to vote, for example, in the international fora in alignment with their space interests, particularly as we talk about the importance of formulations of norms and standards. So the bottom line is these are often in inconsistent with our security interests and our fundamental values uh, like free markets. So, at our institute, we observed uh, 90 countries already involved in such partnering uh, uh, arrangements. I think we what we should ask ourselves is what is going to be the number of such partnerships in one year from now or in five years or, or from now. So the point is that uh, this buying, if if you'd like, uh, for international space partnership is is in fast forward uh, for, for China and also Russia, but that's not the case with regard to uh, the Western model. So I think that's one of the things that's got to change as more and more countries want to go into space and as more and more commercial actors want uh, to see investments in, in space. Well, great. I, I am eager to move our conversation to, to talk a little bit more about national security, but we've got one uh, good commercial question that I would like to squeeze in here before we move on. Michael Bruno has asked, part of the tech startup ethos is to scale up quickly and dominate a market, but that's not necessarily what the government wants when it comes to contractors or industries. How do we bridge that gap between letting industry innovate and advance in space while also foster, fostering a more equitable economic playing field? Alan, is that something that you could comment on? Uh, I can give it a shot. Michael, thank you for that, that question. You know, I, I guess from a certain perspective, I come at it from a free market perspective. And, and you know, I, most of these companies continue to make large parts of their revenues from the government. So gov the government does have a say, but from, from the other perspective, I think the markets demand, um, the markets will govern essentially how, how that plays out. Um, how, of course, then if one or two of these companies become too monopolistic, kind of like Google, Facebook, and Twitter are these days, I, I imagine maybe we have learned from that and we can step in a little bit earlier. I will say that we do need to support U.S. Uh, startups because I, I think, you know, we do have the Chinese government supporting their startup ecosystem, whether directly or not directly. And, and personally, I would rather 
we have a better, um, I guess, more innovative and agile and responsive startup ecosystem than they do. I'll hand that over back to you. Cool, well, great. So I would like to sort of shift gears a little bit to talk more about the national security aspect of, of this report. Um, we heard a lot in the first panel about the, the potential of working more with China and working more with other international partners, which has been the way the U.S. has operated in space for, for a long time, especially on the civil side. You look at the International Space Station and the long-term partnership with Russia there. Um, and you know, we, we've said it on this panel, we are in a space race. It looks very different um, from the, the Cold War space race, but I'd like to get everyone to weigh in here on whether whether the future of space over the next three decades, if you see it being more collaborative or more competitive. Um, Matt, would you like to start? Sure. It, um, I mean, the unsatisfying answer is it's going to be a mix of both. Uh, the reason is, though, that uh, we have enormous opportunities to be collaborative, one of the strategic advantages of the United States. Right? All strategies start with build on your own strategic advantages and strengths. One of ours is that we have this wide network of allies and partners. Uh, so we can work with many countries around the planet. In fact, it is, it is one of the things that means that as more countries and societies around the earth start going in space, most of them are our friends. So it actually net benefits us relative to authoritarian governments. And that's a great thing. Um, on China and Russia in particular, uh, our work with Russia is obviously complicated. They're a bit of a competitor on the military side, but we can work with them on the civil side. Um, for China, um, China, I guess I would just start by saying, has been on the military side very aggressive in the 2010s. Um, they blew up a satellite in a very crowded orbit in 2007. Um, that has had large safety impacts. Um, and we see behavior in other domains like building and arming islands in international waters and attacking civilian organizations through global computer networks. We should expect analogous behaviors in space. So I think a lot of um, American space planners start from an assumption of we have to be really um, um, thoughtful about how we might potentially engage with China. I hope that there are opportunities on basic science and orbital safety through our civil space program, where we'll have ways of talking to them and perhaps even working with them in those limited areas initially. But there is a big trust deficit to get over at the beginning, uh, largely because of how their space activities have behaved in the last 10 years. Yana, can we go to you next on this one in terms of the, the future of space and whether you expect it to be more, more competitive or more collaborative? Well, first, I completely agree with Matthew that the United States has a lot of partnerships uh, around allies and partnerships uh, around the world. Uh, but I, at the same time, I believe we just should not sit back and relax because I think the situation is completely different now than, for example, even five years ago. Uh, I think that in particular, when we talk about the major space actors, again, you know, that is those actors that have um, that are able to offer their partners some kind of comprehensive uh, space architecture that is mainly China and Russia, that we're seeing, especially on the part of uh, China, supported by their uh, economy, a, a really great outreach. The problem with this is that you know, oftentimes these partnerships created a uh, create uh, that they establish, they create dependencies uh, on the part of the recipient countries that can last for a decade and more. Because as as those, if a country agrees to adopt, uh, for example, the Chinese hardware and infrastructure rather than the allied one or, or US one or European one, I think longer term it will think about the equipment and services and products that derive from those from those infrastructures right so i think we we need to think about that as we move forward and uh, think about also those recipient countries you know because they will become vulnerable uh, to uh, to such decisions that might not be their own and uh, frankly it, it it's again linked to sustainability what kind of uh, commerce are we going to be promoting long term and uh, I think that the 
hallmark, for example, of, uh, of, of the Chinese, but also Russian, we saw it also in the past in the Soviet Union, is, the, is this, again, this package deal. That means, uh, you know, they will provide everything from uh, uh, bu uh, building a satellite, launching it, operating it, construct ground station, provide operating personnel. But moreover, they're able to provide oftentimes 100% subsidized financing. This is something we really cannot compete with. Uh, uh, and so we need to find ways how to work around that and think about how can we make our partnerships with, uh, with, with other countries uh, you know, uh, attractive down the road. So the growing space economy, you know, we've heard a lot about how many opportunities are going to be, especially commercial opportunities. Um, that's all going to need some sort of protection. We obviously have the space force now, um, but Deborah and Ellen, I'd love to get your take on sort of what, what you'd like to see in terms of a, a government or, or non-government, but in, in terms of the, the structure that, that should be in place to protect these commercial interests in space. Um, you know, we, we heard the last panel talk about how it's Space Force probably is in the blue water Navy, at, at least not yet. Um, but Ellen, if, if we could start with you about who who should be this this function that this organization to protect commercial space interests. Mm, that's a hard one, although I've already heard conversations around the Space Force also having a space guard, given that um, we're going in that trajectory. And I, I, I think that we should start exploring the notion of something like that, just because uh, the, the economic activity in in not just LEO, but cislunar and even beyond, I will just continue to grow. I mean, clearly, we already have our geosynchronous satellites up in the geo orbit. Um, I already know of three or four stealth companies looking to monetize um, their activity near cislunar area. So it's not necessarily the NASA contract, but they're thinking about how do they actually sell my, sell data, et cetera, back, back to whoever needs it, who wants to go to that area. Um, and in, essentially, bottom line, increasingly, there's more activity. How do we do that, however, might not be in space? I think we need, you know, by the time, if something happens in space and we start shooting in space, you know, it's game over. Really going back to what one of the previous uh, speakers said is that we really need to figure out, figure out how to shore up our activity here on Earth. The, the, the conversations here on Earth. What are the penalties here on Earth for for not playing nice? I, I think we need to have those conversations soon and soon. Um, I would I, I'll bring up a Chinese proverb, which you know, Confucius says, "Keep your friends close, keep your enemies closer." So it's it's about time that that we really reach out and have have hard conversations around what's going to happen if you know something something untowards occurs. I, I mean, the Russians just did it last year. I don't know where they're going to go again. We need to just figure it out. Over to you. Do you have anything to add on that in terms of the, the risk that industry is facing in space? I mean, uh, Ellen said we need to act on this soon. Are, are you already seeing dangers in, in space that are facing industry? So, you know, industry plays a number, a number of roles. So one is supporting uh, uh, government activities for military and civil purposes, which uh, in that case, they are the customer and uh, we're relying on their um, governance and their their activities to sort of keep, uh, keep awareness of the space domain, space situational awareness. And then as as more um, commercial capabilities introduced, and maybe I'll use the example of uh, proliferated low Earth orbit constellations. So a lot of satellites um, in low Earth orbit going up to provide, uh, for example, commercial communications capability or um, uh, tracking services or weather. And we have commercial companies investing in that, in that capability. Um, and we also have the government wanting, or the US government wanting to take advantage of adapting this kind of uh, either the, for example, broadband communications that are being provided, um, like a company like OneWeb or, or uh, was mentioned of SpaceX and Amazon and others who, who, and, uh, who are developing these constellations. And then on um, 
uh, on the supporting side with the investments in technology, and I use Airbus as an example, um, this is a key focus where we're leveraging commodity uh, manufacturing at scale that we are doing for uh, OneWeb and then taking that same capability and adapting it for military purposes. So we are seeing increasingly blurred lines, I would say, between um, uh, who is doing who is doing what in space and then uh, where is the responsibility for for some of the governance and, and behaviors. You know, a, an example that comes to mind that uh, maybe using an automotive example, uh, you know, we have now uh, rules of the road, literally, of stop signs, yield signs, traffic lights, uh, blinkers on cars, so that we can understand and predict the behavior of uh, automobiles around us. And when we've talked about servicing in in space, so in the in the US, if you if you break down on the side of the road at midnight, and if I'm a single woman driving a car and somebody pulls up and says, Oh, I can help you, um, is that is that good or bad? Is that a trusted service person? Uh, did I call, for example, AAA to come save me? AAA would be trusted. I have a membership, I made the call. But if somebody just showed up and said, I'll help you, how do I know they're not going to hurt me? So you can take that same analogy into space and with my satellite and everybody's around, are they friendly? Are they not so friendly? Are they just innocent and don't they, they're a student driver and they don't know where they're, where they're going? Um, or did somebody fall asleep at the wheel? Uh, you know, you can see where this analogy is going. Uh, but these are, you know, these are multi-million dollar investments or assets at at risk and uh and as i shared in the earlier in the earlier presentation just earth observation is one example if we knock out a satellite whether it's by accident or on purpose or just end of life um there's there's kind of a trickle effect into into the community so we need to be thinking about what are these rules of the road where does the governance who is responsible for um, uh, cleaning up debris or making sure it doesn't it doesn't bump into my satellite, um, and and that I'm aware of of all of all of the risks. So that's something that we really haven't um, that, that we're still struggling as an international community. And this is where we look to bodies like the United Nations or uh, to our own FAA or State Department who are negotiating sustainability of space in the broader international community or treaties, industry is not going to do that. We can give our views, but we won't be the ones um, um, negotiating. Uh, and maybe I'll add one other thought you know, on the national security side is, is the, the products um, that come from what we do in space and what the national security aspects of those are from uh, cybersecurity, uh, trusted data, uh, what, where the supply chain has come from, how do I know? So just like if, if uh, the example of AAA pulling up to my car, um, how do I know they're giving me good quality information or that, that the fuel to refuel my tank is high quality and it's not uh, going to introduce some other um, some other unknown risk. So these are very complex questions and um, industry addresses these in other, in other markets you know, all, all the time. And because the nascent space community does get a broader commercial presence, we will see more and more discussions and probably and problems too uh, that, that will creep up and uh, uh, I'm sure something will come up that we haven't anticipated and then uh, everyone will scramble of, of what to do next, which is why the report is so important because it does give kind of a roadmap of the considerations um, to come up from now over the next 10, 20, 30 years. So I, I definitely want to pick at that thread a little bit about international fora and what sort of rules of the road need to be addressed, kind of why this is so important. But to start off with Greg, I, I'd like to go to you to sort of set, set the scene of what's at stake here. There, there are so many aspirational 
you know, potential goals in space that are, are mind boggling things as we look out 10, 20, 30 years. And I, I'd love to get your take on sort of what happens to, to those aspirations in space if nations can't agree on, you know, rules of the road and norms of behavior, sort of, I, I'm hoping you can set the scene a little bit for, for how and, and why it's so important to have these international agreements in place to sort of pave the way to our, our most aspirational goals as a nation in orbit. So we should realize that we're just at the leading edge of space commerce now. The, I, I think uh, our grandchildren will look back and, and say, you folks thought you were doing business in space back in, in the early 21st century, but it was so tiny compared to what we do every day. Uh, you know, w w those of us that have been in the space business for a long time, we tend to think that uh, the, the biggest civil space budget in the world of NASA, for example, of 20 billion is a lot of money, but it equates to a handful of, of North Sea oil platforms. That, that industry can deploy in a matter of months or years, a few years. So uh, when, when we see commercial activity, right now, for example, telecommunications, it's, it's very much like the way we used electricity at the time of the Civil War. We used it to move data around through telegraph systems. Uh, it was only another 50, 60 years later that we started to use electricity to move energy around as, as a, as a uh, for one of the most fundamental markets in the world. We, we will see people like Gerard O'Neill, uh, there's a movie about him coming out on, uh, over the weekend, uh, the professor of physics at Princeton that foresaw much of the space commerce we see today. Um, uh, his ideas of space habitats will enable space to address the largest market of all, the roughly $400 trillion market of real estate. Mark Twain said famously, you, we should invest in it because they're not making any more, but we will. We will be with habitats. So what's at stake is that entire future. And, and in fact, the, the, uh, more important than the commercial future is the future of our species. Um, survival of the next hundred years probably depends more on our ability to combat the big problems like climate change that we face, and space can do that. So that's why we want to be careful about it. But I also want to point out what Scott Pace said something really important. He pointed out that we have a lot of space law already and it works. And in what, what we should do though, because it's a time urgent problem is make it work better. And what does that mean to business? It means reduce uncertainty, have a more certain investment climate. Uh, that's the accelerant for entrepreneurial space. And and uh, uh, we can do that if we change our perspective and look at these big uh, visionary uses of space. And that's why this report is so important because it, it's, a, it's, it's a real sea change from the old standard doing space like, like uh, our parents did kind of situation. So I'm happy to see it. Uh, I'm also optimistic. Look, we, we were talking about the problems of working with the Chinese. Well, guess what? We, we, we managed to craft, cobble together a way to work with the Soviets or the former Soviets who used to have and still do have nuclear missiles pointed at us and we at them. So I'm, I'm quite optimistic that we can muddle through. It's a question of, can we do it fast enough to beat the big problems? And that's why uh, some of the, the new, activities that are underway, like the Artemis Accords, uh, are, are heartening because it's a step away from the, the, the 60s style treatment of space as Antarctica, as opposed to treating space as a whole uh, new frontier. The other thing is that space itself is the antithesis of what we are used to in our, in our bones, which is zero-sum game. All of us that have dealt in political science are, are steeped in and have hardwired into us the notion that it's a zero-sum game competition until it's not. And there are still some zero-sum game aspects, but even things like worrying about the Lagrange points, they're, they're, not, they're not the same order of magnitude of limitation as the Straits of Hormuz. They're very, very different. So um, it's critical that we change our perspective and and 
I think now is the right time for it because we are seeing completely new players. We're seeing new opportunities. We have chances for new alliances. As Yana pointed out, you know, we see, for example, people like uh, uh, countries like the Chinese creating dependency-based alliances. We've been pretty good as uh, as as Americans uh, and as the NATO countries in in being generous, and it's in our interest to be generous to build open-ended alliances. And in space, the biggest one would be provide launch services. The barrier to other countries getting into space is getting into space. It's ridiculously expensive. There are some interesting technical ways that if we chose to, as a country, to say let we're going to open up space in a big way. We can increase the launch rate, decrease launch costs, and, and help other countries become our partners in space in a way that, that's, uh, that will create strong, long-lasting alliances. Well, great. You mentioned the Artemis Accords, which are, of course, an, an agreement NASA is trying to, to partner with other nations to return to the moon. We got an audience question on that um, about international cooperation on the moon. Jeffrey Parsons asks, what international norms would you like to see develop to guide commercial and national ambitions on the moon, such as lunar mining? Yana, would you like to, to start us off on that one? Well, uh, first, let me just say that uh, I will, I, international fora, such as the UN COP US, ITU and others are immensely important for, you know, as we move forward with space activities and discussion and a platform to understand what countries are doing globally. That said, I think, again, if we are talking about setting norms and uh, some principles and even standards as we move forward, these fora seem to actually be lacking in some aspects. And, and certain countries are uh, promoting their own, and there is no consensus on, on those. For example, we all talk about transparency, so that would be uh, that would be a good norm. <laughs> that would uh, be also valid if we do activities on the moon or elsewhere. But what do you what do you mean by transparency? You know, how do you how do you uh, how do you as a country uh, uh, deal with that? How how do you present it? And that goes back to value system. Do you trust? the other actor that it that that actor is transparent so when we talk about international forum they're immensely important but i think it's also very important to understand that they actually measure political will of countries and you know we need to be determined to promote certain norms and uh and and actually uh present it as such at these international uh, for uh, these international fora but uh, things like if we go about if we go back to space commerce for example and i think things like accountability uh free market oriented policies good corporate governance uh protected sovereignty of of countries that that conduct commerce reciprocity and fairness these are all norms that we need to i think follow if we want to move forward with that with the space commerce Great. We, we have another audience question. Looking, looking at Apollo and the fact that looking at the, the space race and the competition between the US and the, the Soviet Union, um, that is, is looked upon not favorably, but you know, Apollo is hailed as this, this time that American ingenuity sort of came together and accomplished greatness. So, uh, the question is, what elements of Apollo successfully translate to today's space program? Is there anyone who'd like to start us off on that? Well, I'll start because I lived through it uh, as a child. And uh, I, I knew that I remember being in grade school and thinking, when I'm in high school, humans will walk on the moon. And they did. Um, Apollo is most important, I think, to prove to people everywhere in the world that humans are smart and can tackle tough problems. That's what we believe at XPRIZE. We put forth challenges and, and we're, uh, and overwhelmingly people pile on and solve them. So uh, 
any any kid could could have told you in 1962 when I was maybe eight years old what was the raison d'etre for, for Apollo in four words. It was if you're an American to beat the Russians, and if you were a Russian, it was to beat the Americans. There's a new four word raison d'etre for space, and it is to save our civilization. It's to overcome the existential challenges that face our civilization and our planet. And if we face tough challenges, we can pull together, not just as a country or a region or, or a company, but as a, uh, you know, as a species. Uh, uh, Saul Griffith has pointed out that, that dealing with climate change is a, is a task that's equivalent to the entire battle battles that took place in World War II, the entire, entitle, uh, uh, sorry, the entire mobilization of industries that it took to win World War II. But in this case, it's with everybody on the same side. And we need to, we can use, you know, somebody famously said, I guess it was Emmanuel Rahm was quoting the old proverb, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. We face a planetary crisis. Uh, uh, we actually face a couple of them. We, we now know that we've been lucky so far in, in not having any asteroids hit us recently. You know, we've had a hundred million years since the last big bad strike. Um, but the probability of that is relatively small. The probability of, of the catastrophes of climate disruption to our civilization uh, is much, much larger. So I, I think the, the big lesson of Apollo is, you know, we used to, people used to say, that they would use spaceflight as the epitome of what was impossible to do. Apollo proved we could get to the moon. Uh, it, it maybe gave us a, a bit of a premature peek at the benefits of spaceflight that we would not have naturally had historically for another 100 or 200 years. We're lucky to have had it. We can learn from it. But the biggest lesson is we can do it. It's not the lesson of the specific technologies or even the lesson of the specific chemistry of the moon. It is we're smart and we can do these things if if we pull together. And I think that the the, the national security aspect, the security aspect, is bigger than national security. It's global security. And and this report makes a nice dent in the old paradigm. I'm glad to see it. I would add. I was only going to add. Um... I don't, I don't disagree with everything that Greg just said, and I especially resonate with his final points there, but I would add an additional point that a resonant element of today with Apollo is a spirit of optimism. Uh, it showed that we could be builders and creators, that our best years are ahead of us, and that we can build our own future. Well, what a great hopeful note to end on. We're unfortunately out of time. I, I do hope, as uh, Ben said, that everyone takes the time to read this report. If, if you've read even a piece of it, you know we could keep talking about it all afternoon, but we are unfortunately out of time. So I wanna thank each of our panelists for joining us. Thank you to the Atlantic Council um, for, for writing this report and putting together this great event. Um, and thank you to everyone who tuned in. I hope you have a great rest of your afternoon.